Well, thanks, Arun. It's, it's, it's great to be here. I, I have the fortune of getting to travel to a lot of universities and interact with students and faculty. And I, I must say, this is by far my favorite place uh, to attend. Um, I said the same thing at MIT. No, I'm just kidding. This is, <laughs> this is uh, you know, the, the other thing is uh, you can, uh, that was the nicest way anybody said I was old, um, kind of back to 87. But what does make you feel old is every time you come to university, the students are always 18 to 22. And each year I get one year further away from 18 to 22. So, uh, um, but, uh, but I'm looking forward to it. I, I do look forward to talking about uh, really what Arun said, which is there's a lot of talk about energy. There's probably more talk about energy today than there has been in a long time. Uh, I'm going to talk in this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about the external environment. This is a technology talk, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on policy or uh, the other elements. They're obviously very important, but I really want to talk about the role of technology from an outside perspective first, and then bring it back internally, and I'll talk a little bit about the work we're doing uh, within our labs uh, at, at ExxonMobil and talk about the, uh, the solutions that we're working on, which we think are part of the, uh, part of the solution. But when you think about energy, it is, it, is, uh, it is often taken for granted. When you woke up this morning, I don't think any of you wondered if the lights would come on when you hit the switch. Uh, none of you were worried about a rolling blackout during a football game last night, at least not during the first half. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, we live in a world where uh, if you have it, you take it for granted, and if you don't have it, it's magic. There's still about a billion people who don't have access to energy, largely in the developing world, and, and quite frankly, that's the goal. They want, they want the same quality of life we have, and while people always think about cars and airplanes, the reality is everything in this room is either a direct derivative of energy or one step from energy. So whether it's the, the clothes we're wearing or the, the upholstery or the carpeting or the computers, everything is tied to energy. So it really is quality of life. It's simple things like washing machines. It's simple things like medicine. And all those have a huge energy component. So it is everywhere. It underpins everything. You know, you hear people say energy is essential to life, and I certainly believe that. And now we're faced with the challenge of how to continue to, to grow energy supplies as 7 billion people become 9 billion people. And as Arun said, the challenge now is how do you do that while mitigating emissions? Uh, while getting on the two-degree pathway. And, um, our thesis is that's largely a technology challenge, that we've got to work on technical solutions. And one other concept before we get into this is just remember one of the challenges in energy is scale. Scale is almost impossible to explain. So I can wow you with the units of hundreds of millions of barrels a day and gigatons and gigawatts, and no one really knows what it, well, Stanford students know what a gigawatt is. People know what a gigawatt is, thanks to Back to the Future, but very few people actually know what a gigawatt is. And so it's, it's trying to explain the scale and how do we get to those scalable solutions, which is really the key. So real simple. This is, in essence, the challenge. So the, the chart on the left is uh, the y-axis is the Human Development Index, which is essentially uh, the UN has criteria, uh, living standards, education, Quality of life, basically, is on the, on the axis. And on the right is the energy use per capita and in a different set of units, thousands of BTU per person per day. And you can see, in general, as you move up from the red dots to the blue dots, you consume more energy. And so that's simply put. And you can see also, throughout this talk, you'll see the red dots will be the developing nations, and the blue dots will be um, the developed nations. And you can see the disparity between the developing and the developed, and obviously the developing nations want to get into that upper right quadrant where they can have the, the, uh, the quality of life that we all enjoy, um, and to do that, the access to energy is needed. Now, <clears throat> the challenge, of course, is the good news is we have the energy. So for much of my career, we were worried about not having enough energy, and now we have a lot of energy, but as often once you solve one challenge, another challenge arises. This is the second challenge, and that is how to manage the emissions. And you can see this data, uh, again, OECD versus non-OECD, and you can see the um, energy-related CO2 emissions, and you can see the, the, the tip where it went from the OECDs to the non-OECDs, uh, largely driving this. And that is essentially, you'll hear this phrase often used, dual challenge. That is the dual challenge. How do you do chart one, which is easy because we have lots of energy, 
Chart two, it's easy to control emissions, limit demand. But you don't want to do that. So how do you do the dual challenge? How do you solve the dual challenge, which is providing affordable, scalable energy to a growing middle class, to a growing population, while reducing the risks of climate change and reducing emissions? That is, it's a simple question. It's a very difficult question um, to answer. So let's talk about this. So how do you do this? Now, many, many, many years ago, you guys can do the math. Uh, I was a chemical engineering student, and I remember the first thing we learned in chemical engineering was when you get a problem, the first thing you do is read the problem. The second thing you do is reread the problem, okay? The third thing you do is draw a picture of the problem, which in my world, everything was a box and every triangle was a nice little isosceles triangle. Uh, and the fourth thing you did was listed your assumptions and your pathway. So you were four or five steps into it before you even started trying to solve the problem. And so I'm going to spend a little time talking about, well, how do you, how do you define the problem? Because you could, you could make it a real simple problem, 9 billion people, 2 degrees. That's the problem. But the reality is you have to go one, you have to go at least one level further. And you have to say, well, where are the emissions coming from? And I'm going to call it three sectors. It shows us four, but I'm going to put buildings in with electricity uh, generation. So it's transportation, it's power, and it's the industrial sector. So we've gone from essentially one problem, maybe two, if you said it was OECD and non-OECD, and we've gone from two to six because you have three sectors, and each sector is going to have a unique suite of solutions. So where in the power sector, you're really chasing for an electron. In the industrial sector, if you're trying to make plastic, it's really hard to make plastic out of an electron. You need a CH bond to make a polymer. And so you've got to balance, and you've got to get a field of answers across each one of the sectors. And then while you could easily say it's OECD and non-OECD, it's really country specific. And in fact, in large countries like the US, it's often state specific. So you can see how a simple one sentence dual challenge problem can expand into 50, 100 plus questions all which have to be solved more or less simultaneously to get to the nine billion people in two degrees. So that's the science problem. And again, it's really instructive to think about this across the sectors. And you'll hear, you know, depending on what you read and, and what you follow, emphasis on one versus, they obviously interrelate. So if you electrify the, uh, the, the cars, that will put uh, more pressure on the power grid. And so there is an inter interconnectivity as well, not that the problem isn't hard enough, you now have codependent, dependent variables as well. So that's a way to think about this challenge, and that's, that's certainly the way we think about it. We want to come up with robust solutions um, across the sectors, and then ultimately we will talk about carbon capture and things like that because those cut across all sectors. If you can just somehow pull the CO2 out, that obviously is a, is a, is a changing approach as well. Now, I said I was going to spend most of my time on technology. This is I think there's only one or two charts here that have anything to do with either policy or some sort of a, uh, uh, a model, a modeling basis. And of course, wh who else better to use than Stanford here? So this work was done at Stanford a few years ago. And again, this is a very simple chart. The y-axis is basically energy efficiency, getting more efficient, using less, higher miles per gallon cars, lighter weight plastics, et cetera. The x-axis is literally decarbonization, pulling CO2 out. Each dot is five years, so the dots begin in 1980 uh, through 2015. Um, and what you see is you see the, uh, um, the emissions from 1980 to 2015 and then extrapolated out to 2040 based on public information, NDCs, things like that, okay? And then on the purple-blue line there, obviously to get to two degrees, it's going to be a combination of decarbonization and efficiency. Um, and so that's a hypothetical two degree line. And what you'll see, and this shouldn't surprise anyone in this room, is over the last 25, 30 plus years, we've really been going down the efficiency axis. And we all live it. Our cars are more efficient, the plastics are lighter, uh, everything around us has gotten more efficient. And so you can see the vertical change. Now, to get to, that, to, the, get to the line we wanna get to though, we have to continue to do everything we can 
to be more efficient, so that continues to be important, but ultimately you will have to look for ways to decarbonize, to actually pull CO2 out. And we'll talk about the technology set there. But again, this is another way to frame the question in terms of what are we trying to do and what type of urgency, what type of speed do we need to move it at. That's not a dramatic pause, I'm just not moving forward. Okay, so just to put it in perspective, if you take that line and say, okay, just give me some rough estimates for what we have to do. So efficiency has to continue to get better. So we have to continue to you be know, 50% more efficient than we are today. Low greenhouse gas electricity, so this includes solar, wind, nuclear, as well as uh, power with carbon capture. So it's all, the, all of those there. And we have to get, uh, uh, you know, we have to grow significantly there. We have to get up to 80%. And biofuels, which today make up about 1%, we're going to have to get to 15%. So the, the amount, and by the way, that still doesn't quite get you where you want to get. Okay? So the, the challenge is pretty severe. It's going to require uh, technologies. It's going to require the combination of technology, policy, and infrastructure. You can almost think of those in equilibrium, that once one is set, the other two uh, somewhat become constrained. And you know, our, our view is you want to you try to let technology, you want, you want the policies, you want things that are as technology agnostic as possible so that the scientists and the technology guys can come up with scalable and affordable solutions. Okay? So with that, I'm now going to switch over to, well, okay, so with that as the problem, let's start talking about solutions because we can spend a lot of time talking about the problem, but the real key is how do we solve this and how do we do this. So I want to talk a little bit about how ExxonMobil approaches this. Arun talked about some of the history uh, that Exxon has had in, in energy, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about it, and then I'll pivot away, pivot into what are we actually doing today in our labs um, that some of you may have read about, uh, but I want to talk about that as well. So let's talk about how do we think about this problem. And this, if you boil this down, this is fairly logical, okay? It's a four-pronged approach to progressing solutions. The first thing is take care of your own business. So mitigate emissions in your own operations. So that could be the, the goals we've set on reducing methane flaring as we, as we continue to explore for oil and gas, all the way to how do we get more efficient in how we refine to make the fuels that we all use today and make the plastics that we use today. So first step, mitigate your own. Second step, take care of your customers, provide solutions for those in adjacent businesses. So that could be the polymers we're making that go into the automotives that make the cars lighter. That could be the motor oils, Mobile One, uh, which I'm sure you all use. Mobile One, um, again, makes fuel, fuel uh, increases fuel efficiency. So it's providing energy options for customers, natural gas, making that more available as a, as a alternative to coal, for instance huge emissions reduction if you do that switching. Step three, you got to talk about it. You have to engage in the policy. You have to engage in places like Stanford that has that rare combination of unbelievable science capabilities and unbelievable policy um, generation. And so these, these centers here become great places to talk about uh, climate change policy as well as uh, with the various governments. That's, a, that's not my group. My group does the research, but we have a separate group that really focuses on that. And then finally, and this is what we're going to pivot to in a minute, is with all that said, we have a technology gap. We have to come up with new, affordable, and scalable solutions. And we have to progress those to where we can get those in the field so they can help us get on the pathway we need to get. So that's it. it it's, it's as simple as four steps. It's somewhat logical. As always, it's always the details and it's how do you execute uh, this plan. But that's our approach. And that's what we've been doing for years and we expect uh, to continue to do that. Now, you need to have a little bit of background to say, well, what we're doing is what we've been doing. So this is a very simple chart that goes back to 1940. I could have actually gone back further. But as the years get longer, PowerPoint fonts begin to become the limiting factor here, okay? So, uh, but if I was to show you 1919, 1919 is when we, um, in, uh, was the first process to make isopropyl alcohol, rubbing alcohol. And it was the first petrochemical made. And it was made from propylene in a refinery 
And again, propylene plus water with an acid catalyst will give you isopropyl alcohol. And that, back in 1919, you used sulfuric, dilute sulfuric acid with propylene to make isopropyl alcohol. Now, the world had rubbing alcohol before then, but this was the first time that we made it as a petrochemical, and it changed the scalability of isopropyl alcohol. So if you move forward, and I, I want to just highlight a couple of these, so if I'm going to highlight the first two, which uh, technologies that rolled out in the late 30s, early 40s, but actually the research actually began in the academic world 20 years earlier. Um, the first one, high-octane gasoline, is actually an offshoot of the fluid catalytic cracker. And the concept of fluidization actually goes back to the 1910s, 1920s um, in academia, and the bottom of course, uh, it was all natural rubber back then. It was, it was rubber plants out of which you, you got rubber. And our company was the first to develop the process to make synthetic rubber, butyl rubber, which is still the rubber that's used today predominantly, still the same process used predominantly um, for tires today. Synthetic, the first synthetic catalyst, of course, that was a game changer because that allows you to run reactions at different rates under different conditions to increase yield, get more efficient. Plastic polyethylene, polypropylene, synthetic lubricants. Uh, Arun mentioned the lithium ion battery, just to show you that that was 1970, the Nobel Prize was last year, just to talk about the time scale uh, for energy. And then if you kind of look at 1980, 1990 onward, what you'll see is just getting more bigger and faster. So deep water becomes ultra deep water. Thin plastics become ultra thin plastics, right? Horizontal drilling becomes extended reach drilling. Plastics become specialty plastics. And for those of you my age, you remember having to change your oil every 3,000 miles. Remember Arnold Palmer on his tractor telling you to change your oil every 3,000 miles, and now we have mobile one annual protection. So this is an innovation cycle where you go from concepts, you go to scale, and then you continue to push the scale envelope, sometimes called experience curve, but you, you go down that scale. But where we are now is we're looking for technologies that can take us to the next, uh, to the next uh, generation of solutions. And we're going to talk about how we do that a little bit. Just, um, just real quick, we have sites all over the world. Our core research facility, hopefully it's on there, is in, right in the middle. When, it's my chart, so it's in the middle, okay? I'm sure when the guys from Houston come here, Houston is suddenly the center of the universe. But Clinton, for now, is the center of the universe. You guys know New Jersey, everything's an exit. So this is exit 18 on Route 78. <laughs> Um, it's about 45 minutes, 50 minutes outside of Manhattan. And uh, as Arun said, it, it was designed to be an innovation center for energy. It opened in 1983. There was actually a science article written on the opening of a building, which is a little bit rare for science. Uh, but it was a concept about driving innovation in energy space. And you know, I, I started there in 87, and I still think it's one of the, the better places to, to work. And you can see where we are around the world with uh, technology centers. Um, a little bit of our people real quick. So we, do, we are a science base. We are a technology company. Uh, you can see the number of engineers and, and all the other stuff. Uh, this is uh, off of a patent wall. So we have a patent wall in Houston that, that identifies our people. But you know, when I come to universities, I want to put this chart up because this is a really, really important thing to talk about. When you talk about challenges that we face and the concept of inclusion and diversity, and that, this is really important. So you can see the metrics there. But I'm going to channel you know, myself a long time ago um, in a different era where it wasn't talked about as much. And I remember my father saying, you know, that the, the, the brain has no color. So if, you, if you know, science is the ultimate equalizer. And so if the inclusion diversity challenge we have in the science community is that of thought, is we really need to constructively push each other. We need to challenge each other. But it is one where when you're trying to innovate, Nothing can stop innovation more than, I don't want to hear your idea. And so from, a, from an inclusion and diversity thing, what we try to do in the R&D community is really, really try to drive that, uh, the inclusion of thought, the inclusion of challenging constructively. It is, at the, end of, at the end of the day, the essence of academics is to challenge constructively. Um, but I think it's important that we continue to, uh, to drive inclusion and diversity because I think that is where the innovation is going to come. It's going to come from these adjacencies and making sure everybody's comfortable talking about this challenge we have constructively, which I think is really, really important. Now, how are we organized? And I give this as just a precursor to, to explain why we're working on what we're working. So this is 
essentially how the organization in Clinton is set up. Now, if I had given you guys a pop quiz, and it's, don't worry about the students, they're freaking out right now because they think of pop quizzes. There's no pop quiz. But if I was to give you a pop quiz in the beginning and say, well, how do you think we're organized? The two most common ways people think we're organized are going to be by sector, um, upstream, downstream, chemicals, or by, um, uh, or by application. And, and the reality is, you know, our belief is if you want to run a research organization, you want to do it by capabilities. So you can see that those are somewhat agnostic to the end use, but they are the core capabilities from which you, you drive um, uh, energy. So you have the physics, the computational physics, the engineering physics, you have the sort of the catalysis and the separations. Um, and within the separations, you're gonna have, acid, you're gonna have gas separations, you're gonna have liquid separations, you're gonna have gas-liquid separations, um, things like that. Materials. Materials play such a big role in, in our world, whether it is the, the actual catalyst or whether it's a membrane or whether it's the final product, the polyethylene film, the polypropylene film, et cetera. So materials are very important. And then over on the right, you have uh, hydrocarbons and then what we call emerging energy, which if this was Jeopardy, you'd call it the potpourri round, right? It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the all of the above. It's the staying aware of what else is going on because while we're working in our space, it is critically important from an R&D standpoint that we know what the adjacent spaces are doing. That you don't get the tunnel vision and you're only focused on what you're executing, you don't realize that there's a better idea. And when you're in a transition, as we're in right now, it is, it is extremely important that, you, that you're watching around you as you do this. And so on the right, you see things like organic chemistry, climate science, Arun mentioned uh, IPCC. You know, we've been, we've been co-authors or authors on many of the reports uh, that come out um, from there, thermodynamics, and, and more and more bioscience. Now, that, that is the newest section in our group. We didn't have a, actually, we had a bioscience science lead years ago. We kind of faded away from it, and we've, we started back a bioscience section uh, a couple of years ago because we see a lot happening in the, in the bioconversion and the biocatalysis um, in, in trying to understand how biology works and then taking that knowledge and scaling it. It's also where the algae program resides because of the biology and the, and the capabilities to do gene editing and gene sequencing and things like that, which are, which are huge um, fundamental enablers for what we're trying to do. So that's how we're um, set up. Now, as good as we are internally, we know that we have to collaborate, that we have to work outside. And so this is just a quick look at how we're working across what, um, these are called energy centers, so Stanford has one. You can see the ones that we're working with across the top. And then the y-axis or the column, the, the, the three main sections there, power, transportation, and industry. So this is a great way to stay abreast of what's going on in the state of science. And even my discussions today with some of your faculty and some of your students, again, just reinforces the value of coming out to Stanford and talking to the students and the faculty because you guys are right on the cutting edge and you're paying attention to the breakthroughs in, in academia. And most of what we do in energy started in, in academia. Now, just because I know where I am, uh, we have a long history with Stanford. This is a quick chart. Um, some of you are familiar with GSEP. GSEP was, we were pioneering members of GSEP, and it was a very successful area, 15 years of partnership. We, we put in about $100 million over those 15 years. But with Richard and Sally and Arun's leadership, Sanford, I think, has done a really good thing in moving to the Strategic Energy Alliance, to which we were, um, if not the first member, one of the first. We were the first member, we were the first member, and that was really exciting. Um, and watching just the, the progress just made since you guys kicked that off, and you can kind of see the focus areas there. And you can see how it's hard to imagine a world of nine billion people where you're mitigating emissions where those four focus areas are not critical. And of course, the wild card one there being emerging technology because what a Stanford can do is not just develop the dots, but can connect the dots. And a lot of these solutions end, end up coming from connecting the dots, not a single dot uh, that gets there. So a lot of good work going on here, and we continue to, uh, pro, you know, we love the relationship we had since 2003, and we, we see this happening for many, many years to come. So we're very excited about being here. Okay. We also um, want to talk about uh, the, the work we're doing with national labs and also with, uh, with smaller companies, the rest of the value chain, if you will. So we signed an agreement with the DOE last year 
a 10-year agreement to uh, work with the national labs on developing energy solutions. And more and more, we're, we're looking with, uh, on the right, you see two smaller companies, Synthetic Genomics, who's our partner in algae, and Fuel Cell Energy, which is a carbonate fuel cell company that we're working on with cap carbon capture. And more and more, these, these uh, what I call smaller companies play a vital role in how we go from lab to scale, which I want to talk about now. So when you think about the innovation value chain, and uh, it looks like I'm Photoshopped on that, but I'm not, okay? So this is, um, that was me. Um, and normally I look happy. It doesn't look like I'm very happy with my panel right now, right? Um, I think somebody doctored this picture. That, uh, so uh, this is at Aspen, uh, the Aspen Ideas Festival um, last year. And uh, I got to play uh, sort of player coach. So I was a panel member and the moderator, which I'd never done before, which is fascinating to do. Uh, but what we wanted to show was so how do you go from lab to scale? And what role do we play? So with me uh, across there, the first one is uh, Lynn Liu, and she's head of the Anlinger Energy Center of Princeton. So she's on the faculty of Princeton. She leads the Energy Center. And the concept there is the universities provide the fundamentals, the breakthroughs, but more importantly, the universities have the time and almost the remit to really understand at the basic level what's happening. So we want to continue to work with the universities. Martin Keller is the director of NREL in Golden, Colorado, the National Renewable Energy Lab. So the national labs have tremendous capabilities to take concepts and do them at, at the pilot level scale, a, sm a large lab demonstration, from which we can then understand some of the modeling and some of the scalability <laughs> aspects. To, to the left, to your right, I guess, of Oliver, that, of uh, Martin, is Oliver Fetzer, and he's the CEO of Synthetic Genomics, our partner in the algae development. So they've got the expertise to do the first demonstration. And of course, a company like ours then brings the capital, the project expertise, the engineering expertise to take that and go to scale. And the key here is we are engaged at all three levels. And so instead of doing it from Lynn to Martin to Oliver, what we're trying to do is we're trying to stay in all three of those. And so instead of doing it in series, do things more and more in parallel. And that is one way that you can speed up innovation. You can't put a deadline on innovation, but you can do things to drive innovation. And this concept of this innovation value chain is what we were trying to show there. So universities, national labs, companies, and large corporations working together, clearly identifying the problem. Everybody has a role to play. And then we try to not only play the role of the final um, implementer, but also the integrator across them. And guys like Mark Disco, who's sitting here, is embedded at Stanford to help drive that. So we have folks embedded at the universities, embedded with the national labs, and then working very closely with these companies. And we have four or five of these types of chains already in place um, that we're trying to drive. So let's talk about what we're trying to drive here so I can get to some, some questions. So I'm going to talk about three areas that we're working, one for each sector. And again, they do interconnect. So the first one is carbon capture and utilization. And I think you all know that today it is practice. In fact, we've been practicing it for decades. Uh, it is a liquid chemistry approach. So it's an amine, uh, liquid amine on the back of, a, of either a power plant or an industrial um, facility. And as you can see, it's power consuming and quite frankly, it's complicated. It is not modular. It's high capital intensive. What we're looking for is we're challenging that paradigm and saying, oh, we want lower energy intensive or power generating technologies, and we'd like it to be modular. And so, um, and that's where point source. And there we're working on um, things like a fuel cell, uh, uh, different types of uh, uh, capture ca uh, technologies. And then as Arun said, and this, I I'll admit, I, I didn't know if we'd have a direct air capture program a few years ago, but again, the technology's advancing. We see some things that we're liking. And uh, so we've, we've started looking at direct air capture as well. And of course, direct air capture and natural sinks are probably the only two ways to really go negative. Everything else is going to get you at best to net zero. But if you have to go negative, you need to pull it out of the air, either through a you know, man-made machine like direct air capture or a natural sink. And then once you have the CO2, you have two, shot, two options. You can sequester it, which we've been doing for decades. So that's, uh, that's one option. The other is to somehow take the carbon from the CO2 and, uh, and reuse it. So that's how we're approaching um, power and, to some extent, industrial. Um, the next one is transportation. So while you can electrify uh, cars, 
it is really hard to electrify an airplane. Um, in fact, I don't see it anytime soon. And, you know, an extension cord from Newark to Singapore is a really long extension cord, okay? So batteries, electricity is probably going to be hard. So you need a CH bond. You need a, you need a liquid hydrocarbon. You need an energy density to do it. Um, and, of course, we get that today from oil. But we've been working on biofuels, two routes, algae and cellulose. So the challenge with algae is one of biology. So there's two biology steps needed. You need um, photosynthetic efficiency, so you need to grow faster. And then you need carbon partitioning. You want to get the type of oil you want to get. The challenge with cellulosic is one of scale. So you have to collect the cellulose. You have to co collect the biomass. And then you have to basically break down a very complicated uh, carbon structure to something that you can then turn into a usable oil. So we're making progress on both. We've had some significant breakthroughs on algae. We've been working on it since 2009. A couple of years ago, we had some significant publications in, in understanding um, the sequencing enough so we could go in with the CRISPR-Cas tools and do some gene editing and drive the carbon partitioning to more lipid. Uh, we, still need, uh, we still need improvements in productivity. We still need improvements in the carbon partitioning. We're making good progress. Um, and we've set a target of trying to get to 10,000 barrels a day by 2025. Now, 10,000 barrels a day when units are usually millions of barrels, okay, isn't, is not a big step, but we do believe if you can get to that, you can then scale from that. And so again, it's demonstration of a scalable quantity so that we can then go to scale. On the cellulose, we're still working um, with several partners, and we haven't set it, we have not set a target yet, so I'll give you some feel for where we are in the development. Uh, but there is a lot of cellulose, and uh, we think that's going to be part of the solution as well. On the industrial process, last, lastly, we, you know, this is steel, concrete, refining, and chemicals. And they're all energy intensive. And in fact, if you look at refining and chemicals, they're high temperature, high pressure for the most part. And so how do you do that? How do you do separations without using temperature? Well, you could use membranes. So we're advancing... Membranes with Georgia Tech, we're working with some other institutes on how to do separations. It's a materials game. And on the reactor design, can you come up with, with reactor designs or reactive distillation, things like that, so you can lower the energy intensity of the reactors? Again, it's a paradigm shift away from where we've been, but it's needed if we're going to try to get to the emissions we need. And ultimately, fuels and chemicals, steel, concrete, those are going to continue to be key, key components of our, of our society. So let me play Connect the Dots. And when I left you, Remember the old Batman episodes where you, you had the one episode and you didn't know what was going to happen and you had to wait 28 minutes or you had to wait a week for the next episode, okay? So I left you with the dots not quite hitting the line, okay? And I said, look, we got a lot of ideas on efficiency, but we don't really see any way to go left. We don't know how to get the decarbonization. So I want to now take those three areas and just show you a hypothetical what, what would happen if we did it. So we have to continue to be more and more efficient. So that is a... a you know, sort of a big, big time emerging area at, at, uh, at the top universities is what's called process intensification. So do better heat integration, do better, better ma energy management, work on l better c catalysts, things like that. Continue to do process intensification. Um, and then as you go to decarbonize, two things that can help you get there. One is biofuels, uh, because algae obviously utilizes CO2. Uh, and then um, carbon capture. And so that'll, turn, that'll make you turn left. So that's what we're working on. There's a lot of other science going on. There's a lot of other technology going on. What I was trying to do is explain to you how we choose what we work on, how we choose who to partner with on what we work on, and then how we think it's all part of putting our corporation in a position to compete as the uh, energy transition continues and we get to the point where we can um, have 9 billion people with the uh, emissions targets we want. So, real quick, I, hopefully uh, without being too alarming, the current technology set's insufficient. This is a research problem. This is a technology problem. Um, and that's, what we're, that's, how we're, that's how we're addressing it. We have a long history of solving these types of problems and being part of the solution, not the only solution, but part of the solution. And so we think we understand how to go from lab to scale. We think we understand the types of capabilities we have and how they could apply to the solutions we need. So we want to work on that. And then we're taking that, that long history of science and engineering and that commitment to R&D 
that our corporation has and looking on developing the next generation solutions. So that's a quick tour of what's going on outside, how we think about it inside, and then what we're doing to operationalize our capabilities to address the dual challenge. Again, thanks so much for coming out on a, on a, on a Monday afternoon, and I've got a few minutes if, uh, if there's any questions. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Jay. Um, I think we're all impressed by the depth and breadth of your approach to the problem. Students first. Students <laughs> first. No, that's all right. Some people take this for credit, and they actually have to have credit. Well, that was actually one of my questions. How many of you are here because you have to be, because there's attendance being taken, okay? I mean, that's always the humbling part of these talks, right? And you realize it. 80% don't want to be, okay, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> so you mentioned developing countries and affordable energy. I'm from a developing country and in addition to all the challenges you mentioned, we also have what I would call like a democratic challenge because we, we are improving our sustainable energy, but our l low income communities, they don't have access to it because clean energy simply does not exist to them because they live far away from big cities or from industry zones. How do you think technology can address this democratic problem? Yeah, I think, I think uh, so again, I'm biased. I turn everything into a technical problem, okay? And that's, that's I'll just admit my, my biases here. So even that, to me, boils down to an insufficient set of technologies. So um, even though we have expected mass urbanization to occur over the next 20, 30 years, um, there's still going to be the mix of rural and urban. And so a solution for a <coughs> mega city, you know, a city of 10 million people, the type of grid you're going to need, the types of solutions, is going to be very different than if you're in a rural area where you might be able to get by with a more distributed um, solution. You might be able to, th that might be a place, depending again on other aspects of the country, where um, solar panels um, combining with uh, small-scale storage uh, could fit. And then for the larger cities where you need the mass quantities of energy, you might have to have a bigger grid and have different sources. So I think it's, it comes back to understanding what the problem is and defining the problem and then developing a suite of solutions uh, of which we're developing some and others are developing others, uh, but then bringing all those solutions together and figuring out which ones you are. Right now, uh, I can draw whatever analogy you want. I mean, I, I go back to, you know, kind of academic things. We have the, you have on one set you have solutions and on one set you have problems. And right now we have more problems than we have solutions. So we've really got to build up our arsenal of options such that your community or any other community can look at those options and say, okay, what fits best? And that comes back to that equilibrium between technology, policy, and infrastructure because I think we got to get the technology weight up a little bit and, uh, and understand a little more what the technical options are as we, as we determine what else we need to do. It's a really good question. It's, it's the essence of the challenge. It isn't a singular uh, solution. It's really focusing on what the problem is. That was a good fake out because it looked like he was asking the question and uh, it's just, that was very good. Um, so you gave us some kind of concrete projects you're excited about in carbon capture and biofuels. And I was wondering as a non-expert if you could give a project or an example of something you're especially excited about in that industrial and adjacent sector. So, um, so on carbon capture, I'm going to, um, and, and again, if you, if you look me up, you'll probably see some me talking about these various things, but I'm going to talk about the carbonate fuel cell. And, and what, what do I like about the carbonate fuel cell? What excites us about that is it is, as far as I can tell, the only material that can concentrate CO2 and generate power. So it basically accepts CO2, and then as the CO2 goes across the film, it, it concentrates the CO2 on the other side, and it generates power. So that, that is a paradigm shift. It's modular. It's, 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 it's a battery, right? It's a fuel cell. And so the power, the power sector should be comfortable with something that's modular and looks like something they're comfortable with versus having a chemical plant on the back of a power plant. So, so that's pretty exciting and, and um, you know, we've set some targets out to try to uh, advance that technology to where we can understand whether or not it can actually work. The challenge with uh, some of these things is, okay, to work in an industrial setting, you have different sets of impurities. The problem in, in industry is not the, the core concept of the chemistry, it's the stuff that happens in the real world. 
it's the impurities. It's that it's not always, you know, in a lab, it's always the same temperature and the same pressure and everything is ideal. And then you go outside and life happens. So it's really understanding the robustness of some of these technologies. So that would be on carbon capture. And then on the, on the, on the biofuel side, I'm going to go back to the two things. We're very excited about algae. Again, when it comes back to algae, algae is an organism that is pretty well understood. With the breakthroughs, you know, the, the breakthrough we had in algae, we started in 09. The breakthrough in 17 was actually enabled by two things that weren't even invented in 09. Uh, the first was the supercomputer, so you can just sequence that much faster because there is a bit of trial and error to this. And the other is the gene editing tools. So part of this challenge that we have is one of patience. So while we could have given up by saying there's no way we can manipulate because we don't know how to actually uh, uh, engineer the, the algae, here uh, universities like Berkeley and MIT were coming up with gene editing tools. And that became a huge enabler. So, so both of those, and, and again, why am I excited? Because they're modular, they're scalable. Algae is fantastic. It doesn't compete for water or food. It's brackish water, and it typically wants to be around the equator. So you're not really competing for, for land or for, or for water. Again, because to, to some of the other things that have been said, one problem solved, another problem opened, since you're trying to anticipate as many of these can as, as, as you can. And again, last comment on why I like this, it's our core capabilities fit well with advancing those technologies. So that, that's kind of a quick one. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I really love the, w the work you guys are doing, but let's zoom out a little bit. Uh, so you guys have been in the industry for more than like five, six decades. Yeah. And uh, the problem is, why would we as a society trust you guys to spearhead the innovations that will actually be both uh, affordable and at right. the same time solve the climate change issue because the clock is ticking and you guys really need to stay in business, to be honest. Yeah, well, that, that's true. I mean, we, we, we have shareholders, we have uh, interest. But again, one of the reasons why I wanted to show you a look back was not to, not to say that it's, it's a guarantee that it happens going forward, but to show that it's always been, this is, this is an incredibly technical industry. In fact, it's underappreciated how hard energy is. And I'll just give you a quick example and I'll answer your question. If you want to be a pharmacist, what do you study? You probably study pharmacy. If you want to be a chemist, you study chemistry. If you want to be an energy, what do you study? And in fact, energy may be the only discipline, the only industry that requires every sector of engineering and every sector of science. So while others may hire a geologist, they're hiring a geologist because the geologist is smart. We're hiring a geology because we need to understand rocks. We, understand how to do, we need to understand how to do sequestration safely. So to solve this problem requires that interdisciplinary approach. It also requires, to your point, project expertise because of the scale. And so you need corporations that understand how to uh, put out very complicated chemistries, very complicated engineering solutions at a scale uh, that matters. And that's what the energy sector does. And now what the challenge is, do what you've been doing, do it with a different set of technologies so that we can get on the pathway. And uh, you know, our, our belief is, and I believe this personally, that you've got to be fundamentally sound. You've got to understand the fundamentals. You've got to have the pathway to scale. And then how do you go faster? Well, you, it's, you can't put a deadline on innovation. That's really hard to do. But what you can do is you can change up the way you do things. And that's what that slide on the innovation pipeline was meant to show that instead of doing things in series and saying, all right, Stanford, you guys go spend the next 10 years and develop your ideas. We'll just watch and read the papers, and then we'll come back to you. No, we had active discussions this afternoon saying, OK, if that's what you're seeing, why don't you guys think about this? Because that's what's going to stop it from being scalable. Get in there, you know, sweat equity, have people in the lab collaborating at the national labs. And then, and then the newest link in this value chain are these small companies. I must admit, in 87, when I started, there weren't many small companies like synthetic genomics, like fuel cell energy. Um, there are more and more of those popping up. And so find the ones that, that complement our capabilities, and then try to understand how to cross-pollinate and add capabilities so that we can get there faster. That, that, to us, is the most logical and probably the most probable way to be able to come up with solutions that can be scalable, that can get us where we want to go. It's a really good question, though, and I think it's one that Quite frankly, we all ought to challenge ourselves on is how do we do this more efficiently? And a lot of it is communication. A lot of it is how we work together. 
um, to get this done. Yeah. Hi, thanks for your uh, overview. Um, I, uh, I'm really interested in your, um, in your, I guess, assertion that the problems are essentially technology problems. Um, I, I, I did do some research myself when I was here, and I'm really excited about Exxon's continuing engagement. It's really important. And at the same time, um, I can think of, and I'm sure many others can think of, uh, maturing technologies that are having a hard time getting a foothold in their respective markets, which has a lot to do with uh, market structure and business incentives. And so I, I guess I want to offer a friendly addition that the technology is, is absolutely necessary, and sometimes so too are, are the business incentive structures and the, and the market structure. Um, <laughs> and so, and I was particularly interested in um, uh, when you were showing the four stages mm -hmm. uh, that, that it, by which Exxon engages um, these questions. The first that you had was uh, optimizing Exxon's own internal processes. So, um, so with the, the broader question in mind of what is driving these from the market perspective, I was interested to hear if you can share any insights on what is, uh, what is the internal ExxonMobil business case for doing things like reducing methane leakage or for uh, process intensification. Um, how, does, how does that look to the, um, what is the investment case for those to the business managers who need to sign off yeah. on the necessary investment? Well, so let's first start with the most logical thing, which is um, you'd much rather capture the methane and sell it than not, okay? So there's obviously an incentive to being as efficient as you can be. Um, so it starts there. There's never a downside to efficiency. And I think what, what has happened is, is as we understand the various components of efficiency and our analytics get better and our ability to understand where we have value leakage is what we call it, uh, you want to try to close those value leakages. There's a huge business proposition to being more efficient. Um, the second part was? Okay. Yeah, so that's the business case. And, and then, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it comes down to just that. There's, there's never, it rarely is being more efficient a bad thing. And it's just how you define more efficient. And so we're now looking at that efficiency along those axes, which is how do we mitigate emissions in our operations. I will say the other thing where I thought you were headed, which is, look, technology and policy have to go together. I'm the technology guy, so I'm going to talk about technology. If we'd have brought my policy, the policy guy with us, he'd have talked about policy. And in fact, we often give a talk where we go back and forth because it is important. And, and my belief is the technology guys have to really talk about what is possible and what we're doing to get there to be possible. Okay? I have a question back. Okay, I'll see you after. Oh, first yeah. of all. Really, you're wearing a Penn shirt at Stanford. I know. <laughs> Very ironic. I don't see many 49er shirts, though, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I want to ask you, yeah. you kind of touched upon it a bit, but uh, when it comes to carbon sequestration, it throws a lot of criticism for being, uh, for being too costly and too complex, uh -huh. as well as potentially a temporary solution. And you kind of uh, went over a bit with the whole carbon cycle. I was wondering yeah. what potential avenues do you see in the future to solve those problems? And what yeah. role do you see carbon sequestration, uh, carb carbon capture and sequestration playing in the future? Yeah, so I actually encourage you to read some of the papers out of Stanford. Uh, that have been written on sequestration because a lot of the pioneering work on understanding how CO2 can be um, sequestered safely and for uh, pick your unit of time, but for a long, long, long time has actually been done at Stanford, has been done by the Department of Energy, and has also been done by, you know, and then companies like ours have experiential uh, 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 experience with, uh, with sequestration. So, um, yeah, I, I think uh, CO2 sequestration is a, is a very good thing to do. It's obviously a, an expertise we have because it's, it's kind of reversing what we've done, which is instead of taking it out, you put it back in. And so it is geology, it's engineering, it's, it's moving gas at, at, uh, at pressures and temperatures. So it is something that we feel comfortable doing. And now it's a question, again, of getting the other components that are needed for CO2 sequestration, like infrastructure. Because if you, if you capture CO2 on a power plant, that's great. Now you've got it captured. It's unlikely that you can sequester right where you capture. So you then have to move the CO2. That comes into infrastructure. That comes in policy and all the other things you said. But it, to me, it still starts with, uh, I think there's better ways. We can't be satisfied with the solutions we have today for carbon capture. Um, so we've got to get better at CO2 capture. The rest is more or less straightforward. How you move CO2 in pipelines is fairly well understood. And then there's plenty, plenty, plenty of studies on 
where you can safely um, store um, CO2. And it's been validated a lot by Stanford, but as well as not just the US government, but, but governments around the world. So I think if we can come up with a scalable, reliable, affordable way to do carbon capture, the other two pieces will come in line. Okay? Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks. Let's thank PJ and last time. <laughs>